Okay, so the next module in our online workshop is going to include a preoperative planning module. This module is going to take you about 45 minutes, or this lecture, this workshop is going to take about 45 minutes. Um, this is going to be our opportunity to interpret the radiological inventory that you just learned about and um, interpret it onto a 3D model. The um, ultimate goal is to understand a fracture well enough um, based on the plane films and the CT scan to be able to take it to the operating room with a pretty comprehensive preoperative plan. Now that's dependent on understanding the fracture far better, better than just being able to say this is a transverse posterior wall fracture. So Dr. Mark Riley is going to take us through this, this particular fracture. Our objectives are to learn a standardized method of interpreting the radiographic features of a fracture and then translating this understanding into a three-dimensional model. The ability of uh, this ability is the foundation not only of classification, but probably more importantly, an intricate understanding of the fracture's morphology, such as to be able to perform a reduction in fixation in the operating operating room, and then also to use your biplanar fluoroscopy to evaluate and analyze your reduction and your ultimate um, fixation strategy. So this would be an example of what you'll hopefully be able to come up with after performing these exercises. In order to succeed at this module or at this exercise, you'll have to have watched Dr. Wilbur's radio, uh, lecture on the radiographic interpretation of the standard or uninjured acetabulum. And I would also point you to Professor Letronel's chapter three. Uh, this is the normal radiology. But understanding that the lines that we see on the x-ray correspond very specifically to uh, known entities or known osseostructures in the pelvis itself. From the, from the information that you've already learned, you've probably come up with the fact that there are specific radiographic landmarks that we evaluate every time on the three standard films, the AP pelvis, the obturator oblique, and the iliac oblique. What we're now going to do is, trans, uh, is take that information and uh, apply it to an injured model or an injured um, a radiograph that's now injured. You're going to use the same approach, understanding the six landmarks, starting with the AP pelvis. And for example, understanding that the iliopectineal line disruption indicates a disruption in the pelvic brim. And Dr. Riley will take you through this step by step. Moving on to the ilioischial line, a, representative, a representation of the quadrilateral surface, we'll be able to take the uh, scene injury on the radiographs and apply that to our three-dimensional model. And Dr. Riley is going to take about 35 minutes of your time, maybe 40, to take this fairly complicated radiograph and translate all of the films, not only on the AP pelvis, but the obturator and the iliac oblique, and learn to use the CT scan to confirm what you've already drawn and also understand better the articular injury. Again, in order to succeed at this exercise, you're going to need to have watched and understood Dr. Wilbur's video on the anatomy, I'm sorry, the radiological correlates of the normal acetabulum. Also, I would point to, uh, again, to Professor Letronel's chapter three, and you'll need to have a model in your hands that you can make marks on. Uh, at least it really, really helps. Um, this can just be a plain old uh, sawbone model and a pencil or a marker, but you'll want to have something in your hands as you follow Dr. Riley along with this exercise. I'd also point out that it's a great opportunity to utilize the resource of the online exercise. Use your pause button, reverse when you don't understand something, and then refer back to Professor, Professor Letronel's chapter as necessary. You're going to be doing this for about, th this exercise is going to be a part of your day um, on the first day of the course. We're going to take three hours of your time to really teach you how to do this in the in each one of the different fractures that we're, we find ourselves up against with acetabular uh, fracture work. And then at, building on that foundation, we'll move forward with the reduction and fixation strategies. So again, I'd like you to take your time with this, and you'll have to have a good understanding of this information in order to really make the most out of your face-to-face -face time at the course. Let's go on to Dr. Riley's video.
Some people will say, well, why do I need to go through this exercise? I can just ask for a 3D reconstruction. In fact, at a lot of places, you don't even have to ask for the 3D reconstruction. The radiologists give it to you anyway because they get to bill extra for it. But you don't have a 3D reconstruction available to you in the operating room. You have a fluoroscope. You have 2D imaging. And so if you understand how to take your plane radiographs and translate them to a three-dimensional structure and go backward and forward, then when you're looking at your plane radiographs of your reduction or as you're struggling for your reduction or your post-operative radiographs after your fixation, you're going to understand what you're seeing. It's not a big stretch to say that if you don't understand the anatomy of the fracture, you're unlikely to be able to effectively, accurately reduce it. And so that's why we, this is such a critical exercise to go through. So we're going to introduce you now to basically preoperative planning or templating or drawing out a fracture on uh, an intact model from our displaced x-rays. And so... What we're going to do here is we're going to look at the, the AP pelvis radiograph and we're going to initially begin by translating from that the disruptions of our radiographic lines, right? So we have six radiographic lines of Jude that we look at on the AP pelvis and we're going to translate those to our, our uh, dry erase pelvis. The first one then is the iliopectineal line. As I trace the iliopectineal line up on the injured side, I can see that I clearly have a disruption of it and that it's occurring above the confluence of the iliopectineal line and the ilioischial line. Therefore, those lines have a confluence here where they overlap about at this level. And so I can see therefore that I'm going to have a disruption or a disruption of the pelvic brim here above that point of confluence and I can draw that point there uh, on the pelvic brim and then as I rotate this back to simulate an AP pelvis you can see that we're going to have a disruption in line with this going back to the greater sciatic notch coming right across this area of the sciatic buttress and then on the AP pelvis, you can see that as I rotate this back to simulate the AP pelvis, those are going to overlap, and they're going to give me that very clean appearing disruption of both the ilioischial and iliopectineal lines at the same location. All right. Now, I'm going to look to the anterior rim shadow. All right. So I think it's important to look now here on the intact side and understand the anatomy of the anterior rim is such that it has this uh, concavity, this point of inflection where it goes here from being concave and then here convex and then becomes um, the most anterior aspect of the superior pubic ramus. And so as I look to the anterior rim shadow on the injured side, I can follow it up from the roof of the superior pubic ramus and I see that I have a clear wide disruption of the anterior rim shadow. Now where is this occurring? It's a occurring medial to the anterior inferior iliac spine and it's occurring lateral to the point of inflection on the anterior wall. So I know here's my point of inflection on the anterior wall. Here's my anterior inferior iliac spine. And so I know that this fracture is propagating just down here to the anterior rim in this area of the psoas gutter. Okay. Now it's tempting at this point to extrapolate that I can go from this point to this point, but I'm going to wait on that I just know that I'm exiting here and crossing the anterior rim at this point. Okay. Now let's look to the posterior rim shadow. As I follow the posterior rim shadow, my eyes are first drawn to a wide displacement of the posterior rim shadow that appears to be in line with the dis disruption that I was seeing in the anterior rim shadow. So if here's my anterior rim shadow, I'm now seeing a disruption of the posterior rim shadow, which is exactly in line with it. And so I'm going to put a mark here on my posterior rim shadow to represent what Tanya is drawing there as well as a disruption. But now if I follow my posterior rim shadow distally, I can see that it, it's intact, intact. But then as I get down to the low portion, just adjacent to the, to the subcotyloid groove, I can see that there's a disruption uh, exiting here, very low as well, on the posterior rim. And so I'm going to make a mark there. This area right here represents the subcotyloid groove, okay? And that appears as a transverse area just distal, let's go to the intact side, uh, just distal to the posterior inferior rim of the, of the acetabulum. 
And so on this injured side, I can see that there's some alteration of the bone in the area of the subcotyloid groove, almost a little bit of a transverse line here in the subcotyloid groove. So I'm going to go ahead and add that in as well. Okay. And now as I follow the posterior rim shadow up, because we always want to make sure that we follow our shadows completely, as I follow the posterior rim shadow up, I see a, what appears to be a minimally displaced secondary fracture line crossing the posterior rim shadow. Uh, and so that here's my, my primary displacement. And just about at this area here, I'm seeing on the plane radiograph something crossing the posterior rim shadow here, much less displaced. So I think I'm identifying three locations where I have fracture lines that cross the radiographic posterior rim. Here, what appears to be minimally displaced, here more significantly displaced, and here significantly displaced as well. So that's four of our radiographic landmarks for the AP pelvis, and I need to go ahead and look at the remaining two. Well, I can see the teardrop well on this uh, right side. It's being split, apparently split by the ilioischial line, which makes it a little bit different than the other side, but I don't see an obvious disruption of the teardrop, so I'm assuming that that's displacement of this fragment of the acetabulum and a little bit of rotation, which is causing it to appear differently, but I don't see a fracture line involving the teardrop. What I do see, though, is that I have disruption of the radiographic roof on the AP shadow. And so I need to, to follow the radiographic roof and compare it to the contralateral side. You know, it's one of the things that we fight with the radiologists all the time about, that they want to give us just views of the injured side and not of the intact side. But we get so much information by going back and forth between the injured side and the normal side. So as I follow the radiographic roof, which remember, as Tanya showed us and Roger showed us in the lecture, represents only a very small portion of this cranial aspect of the true source seal of the acetabulum. I can see that the lateral portion of the roof appears to be in its normal anatomic position, at least until about around the apex of the acetabulum. And then at that point, it seems to change its direction. And so I think that Roughly at this point here, uh, so I'm, I'm again as a landmark, I'm looking just above the line that's being created by that displacement that we saw here. I'm seeing that there's some disruption of the roof right about in this area here. So I'm going to put a point right there on the inside of the of the roof. Okay, and then as I follow that medially. What I can see is it seems like the femoral head is following a fragment of the roof, which is either displaced or impacted or both. And so, and that fragment goes over um, a f roughly about a centimeter or so. So I'm going to just place a little line right there next to that. And then I can see that there's a portion of the radiographic roof on the displaced portion of the acetabular fracture, right? And so I know that there's a portion of the radiographic roof over here. And so I can see that, um, that this portion of the roof that I, I'm pointing at with the marker here has probably gone with the lower displaced portion of the acetabulum. And this portion of the roof represents that impaction. Right. But when I look at that medial part of the roof that, uh, that Tanya has just drawn in yellow, if you could erase the yellow for just a second there, um, Tanya. Um, I, I seem to see on the lower displaced portion that that portion of the roof has two shadows, right? And so I'm thinking that there's a, a little bit of a duplication of the roof of, of the roof shadow even on this medial piece uh, of the acetabulum. And so I'm just going to mark that there because I'm concerned that there may be something going on in that location. And when I look to the roof shadow on the intact acetabulum, I can see that there is a duplication of the acetabular roof shadow laterally, where a portion of it is intact and a portion of it is impacted. So I'm expecting that there is some type of a fracture line splitting the roof into those two fragments even laterally. 
In addition to those six lines, I'm just going to quickly look at the iliac wing where I do not see any fracture lines propagating up the iliac wing and the obturator foramen, and I do not see a ischial ramus fracture or any fractures involving the obturator ring, obviously, at this point. So what we're going to do then is we'll go to the obturator oblique view. I'm going to rotate this here to represent the, the obturator oblique view. Uh, and we know that the radiographic landmarks that we're looking at on the obturator oblique view, there's an enormous list of them. Uh, the key ones, obviously, are the visualization of the pelvic brim and of the posterior uh, rim shadow. And so we're going to look at those first. And I can see that I have this obvious wide disruption at the pelvic brim. Okay. Now, I had previously drawn a mark here based upon my AP pelvis, and as I rotate this into the obturator oblique, I want to know, do I still see that? And I do. That's about where I see my disruption exactly uh, on the obturator oblique, my disruption of the pelvic brim. Now, I wanted before to connect it with this fracture line at the anterior rim, and if I lay a line across that does that plane, is that plane accurately represented by what I see as that displacement? And I think that it is. Now, Tanya, can you show them the anterior rim shadow on the obturator oblique? It's not, we don't typically look at it, but you can see a portion of it there. And so I think that based upon this, I'm safe in extending this line down to the anterior rim because I can see that that fracture line is in fact corresponding to that. And as I rotate this to the obturator oblique, it gives me that appearance, and that's exactly the appearance I would expect to see on the radiograph. So I'm comfortable with that uh, portion of the fracture line. Now, if we look to the posterior border of the bone, we want to see if the marks we placed with the AP pelvis still correspond, right? And so I come to this point, which was that upper minimally displaced um, fracture, and uh, I see that I have uh, some displacement that is occurring uh, here. And then a little higher up on the, on the posterior rim shadow, I don't see a displacement of the rim per se, but what I see is I see a vertical fracture line extending to that supraacetabular surface. So what I see is that I've got some kind of a fracture line there extending cranially. Uh, and I can also see then that I have a displacement here on the, the posterior rim shadow. And as I follow it more distally, I'm seeing a displacement here on the posterior rim shadow, which appears to be about at the mid level of the mid portion of the femoral neck. And so if I pretended that there was a femur in here, we would see that this would be about the mid portion of the femoral neck. And so I'm comfortable with this, with all of these points crossing the retroacetabular surface. What I can see from this is that I can see extension of this fracture line at least partway up into the acetabulum. And I can also see that transverse line or some, some injury there to the subcotyloid fossa that uh, Tanya was just uh, drawing in there as well. Now, obviously, other information that I'm going to get from the obturator oblique will be the status of the obturator foramen, where, again, we don't see an obvious displaced fracture. Do I see any other fractures extending up the uh, iliac wing? And I do not, aside from this uh, small vertical fracture line that we've just uh, picked up. But now, when I look to the radiographic roof shadow of the obturator oblique, I can clearly see that there are two arcs of the roof of the acetabulum laterally, one which the femoral head is following and one which the femoral head has dislocated away from. And because of the displacement, we know that the femoral head is following probably an impaction or a separate articular fragment, whereas the intact roof is being left superior laterally and the femoral head is dislocating away from that. So. Uh, again, I'm expecting to be able to draw, you can't see it on here on the up, but I'm expecting to be able to draw an area of impaction here, which will enable me to uh, accurately represent uh, the um, duplication of the acetabular roof. So now I'm going to rotate this to, to represent a, an iliac oblique view. And again, we're going to confirm the information that we got from the... Um, AP pelvis x-ray, which is that we have a fracture line that we thought was crossing just below 
the uh, curvature of the greater sciatic notch. And so as I follow the greater sciatic notch here, I would say that this fracture line probably exits a little bit lower than I had appreciated it on the AP pelvis, but not much. And so I think this fracture line is going in that direction to exit the greater sciatic notch there, and we can see that displacement uh, there as well. We clearly see the femoral head dislocated away from the anterior uh, aspect of the roof, and following now uh, a, a small area of impacted articular segment that we can see is sitting congruent to the, uh, to the femoral head. The other landmark that we get, aside from the posterior border of the bone on the iliac oblique, right, is the anterior rim shadow. And so we have to follow the anterior rim shadow. And we had already previously drawn this fracture line crossing the anterior rim. So if I look at my anatomy, I can see that I've got my inferior spine, my anterior inferior iliac spine here. And as I follow it down, if my drawing is correct, I should see just a tiny little lip of articular surface before I run into my displaced anterior rim fracture. And that's exactly what we're seeing there. We have that tiny little bit of uh, apparent uh, rim that is intact, and then we have the displacement at the anterior rim, uh, and then the remaining portion of the anterior rim shadow, we can follow all the way down. We can f see the pubic tubercle distally, and we do not see any other breaks uh, in the anterior rim shadow all the way down to the level of the pubic tubercle. Right. We also now can confirm that we don't have any fracture lines through the lower portion of the greater sciatic notch or the ischial spine uh, or through the lesser sciatic notch. And no fracture lines that we can see propagating up into the wing of the ilium. So now at this point, what we're going to do is we're going to go to the CT scan and we're going to use that anatomy to help us confirm our drawings and to help us finish those radiographic features that we haven't been able to fully understand, such as the articular impaction uh, and the multifragmentary nature of the posterior wall or, or posterior rim. Uh, and this is a very typical. It's very typical that you can get a lot of information about the main fracture lines and about where they're crossing the radiographic landmarks, um, but we still do get additional data from the CT scan, from the 2D CT scan regarding these um, uh, other uh, difficult areas to visualize. So we'll go to the upper cuts of the CT scan. The first thing I see on the first cut of the CT scan is that this is our most cranial cut. And on our most cranial cut, what we're looking at is a displacement at the pelvic brim, right, as Tanya showed us. So therefore, when I go back to my bone, I should see that the most cranial aspect of my fracture is occurring at the pelvic brim. And is that the case? Absolutely. As I'm cutting down with the CT scan, I'm going to hit this first. That's the most cranial aspect. So I verify that I was correct in doing that. But I see that there's some additional fragmentation just up at the very top of it. And that's actually pretty common when a fracture line crosses the pelvic brim. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a little bit of pelvic brim comminution there, uh, just where that turns the corner and crosses. Now, I can see that the main displacement of this fracture is occurring largely in the sagittal plane. And I can see that on every one of my six uh, images. And it's important that as I follow that down to see that that plane is occurring medial to the anterior inferior iliac spine. And does that correspond with this fracture as I would expect it to? Yes, it does. This is what we're looking at is the exit point of this fracture just medial to the anterior inferior iliac spine. But I can now see that that fracture line is crossing the roof of the acetabulum uh, on those cuts four and five so that I can go ahead and I can at least extend this fracture line back along the roof a little ways, maybe toward the point that I had drawn before. Okay. But as I look at the roof shadow, I can see that I have some separate fragments of the, the roof. And so I have a portion of the sourceal which is on the intact bone. That is, the, it is intact to that anterior inferior iliac spine. Tanya's just got the red dots on that. That's perfect. But then I've got three other fragments of the sourceal that I need to explain. I have a posterior superior triangular impaction that I can see on uh, cut four there. 
and I have a portion of the roof which has gone with the uh, displaced fragment, with the pelvic brim and with the quadrilateral surface, uh, which you can see very nicely on cut five. And then I have a second portion, uh, that last portion there that Tanya just drew the dot on, which is a posterior medial impaction. And this is an impaction that has occurred on the displaced fragment as opposed to the other, which is an impaction from the intact fragment. And so now I can see that what I'm, what I'm dealing with here is that I have my main fracture line that's exiting to my main displacement at the posterior rim. I have a secondary fracture line that's probably coming through that minimally displaced portion of the posterior rim. Okay. And now I have also a, an area of roof impaction represented by this. And this portion of the impaction is what I'm seeing as that posterior lateral impaction displacing away from the intact portion of the acetabulum and a secondary piece of impaction there and that secondary piece is now displacing with the displacement of the main fracture line. Okay, so let's go at this point to the next six cuts. And what I can see on these cuts again is the continuation of our main fracture line that we've looked at before. Okay, and the plane, but then it, then it disappears after about the second cut. And now I have to start looking at the morphology and the configuration of this posterior wall components. So... I can see that I have a small cranial posterior wall fracture there, and we see that just on the first four cuts, and then it disappears. And that is, where does that start? So that it started uh, previously all the way up. There we have it, and we have it on the next cut there, and a little bit on the next cut there, and then I actually see a little non-displaced crack going just up on one cut up on the ilium, which Tanya just drew in there perfectly. So that is occurring above the level of the source seal, and then we start to see that fracture as we come down to the level of the source seal. And so we know that that is going to represent this posterior wall fragment. here. And so this now we know from the next cuts down, this is a complete posterior wall fracture. And so it is probably coming to join up with our exit point here on the posterior rim of the acetabulum. And so that's going to represent then this fracture of the posterior wall of the acetabulum, and we would expect that that one is not so displaced. But then as we go more, crane, uh, more caudal rather on our cuts, we can see that there's an additional posterior wall fracture that's much bigger, and so we're going to start following that down. Okay? And as we follow that down, it starts, the fracture line now I'm going to follow on the retroacetabular surface, starts relatively lateral, closer to the rim, and progresses a little bit medially as it goes distal. Right, and then comes back again, coming a little bit more lateral again at the level of the ischial spine, which is the sixth cut there. We're right about in the middle of the retroacetabular surface, so I'm down about here. Okay, oops, let me move over here. And then let's follow that posterior wall fracture to our next cuts, and we can see that it it rapidly stops, but it stops below the level of the subcotyloid fossa. So that posterior wall fracture is probably coming around here to meet up with that irregularity that we saw in the, post, in the subcotyloid fossa down here. And now we can see that there's some impaction and there's some comminution down here as well. And so we know that we probably have a little bit of comminution here at the level of the subcotyloid fossa. We still have our fracture line crossing the posterior inferior rim that we saw. 
but now we see that there is a little bit of an impacted articular segment very low here on the posterior rim. Now I want, need to follow that posterior wall fracture cranially. And we can see that, you, that Tanya just drew on the intact portion of the posterior articular surface. And you see how small that is and how close it is to the cotyloid fossa. So I know that this fracture line I've drawn is probably incorrect. And that if that's the, actually I drew the edge of the cotyloid fossa wrong. Um, so that that is actually very close to the cotyloid fossa, leaving a very small rim of intact uh, posterior horn of articular surface, and so that fracture line is going to come down here, and then we probably have this little area of, uh, of articular impaction. So as I follow this posterior wall fracture up, where does it ultimately end up? Let's go back on the cuts there, and we can see that as we follow that posterior wall fracture all the way up, it ends up terminating and coming together here at the level of our impaction. So that as we move cranial in our cuts, the wall fragment is getting a little bit bigger. And then as we move up to this portion, the wall fragment will appear to be, the articular portion of the wall fragment will appear to be much smaller. And also on the outside of the bone, the, the size of the retracetabular surface of that fracture gets a little bit bigger, including the rim. And then as we go up, there's a portion of it where it is only retroacetabular surface and not rim because we have a secondary rim fracture that we saw previously. Okay. So now I've got essentially all of the information transposed here and the only thing I need to do now is see is there any line that I haven't connected and there is. I haven't connected where this fracture crossed the posterior border of the bone and my posterior wall. And that was a difficult thing to pick up on the CT scan, so I'm assuming that that's probably in the plane of the data acquisition of the CT scan. Okay. And it's likely that this fracture line is coming relatively horizontally into the posterior wall fracture here. Okay. And that should complete the, the fracture pattern. And now as I look at this, although we should have been able to tell purely from the radiographs as we were looking, what I want to do is I want to go back to the plane radiographs and confirm does everything still seem to be very reasonable. So I look to my landmarks very quickly and I can see on the AP pelvis I've got this displacement of this fracture line here coming up to the confluence of the ileocial and iliopectineal lines. I'm seeing this multiple areas of displacement along the posterior rim shadow. I'm seeing a single displacement along the anterior rim shadow. I can tell now that I have some complex involvement of the subcotyloid area down in here, creating that kind of lucency uh, in the area, and uh, that I have some impaction of the roof. So I have this portion of the roof that is intact here, and I have this impacted fragment here, which is sitting a little bit more medial to the roof, and I have this impacted fragment here as well that has gone with the, uh, with the uh, acetabular fracture, creating that double density on the AP x-ray of the roof shadow there. Very quickly look at back to our oblique views. Does the obturator oblique view match? Yes, we can see we have the main plane of the fracture line here. As we follow it down, we can see that that fracture line appears to come all the way out and and down here to the low posterior aspect of the posterior rim. We have a secondary large displacement of the posterior rim here, and we have this vertical fracture line in creating that small secondary posterior wall fracture that we can see there. No fracture lines entering into the obturator foramen. And again, look at where our impaction is. This is intact roof of the acetabulum. This is the area of the impaction sitting more medial and posterior to it, and the femoral head's following that, and we have this displaced portion of the roof here on the lower portion of the acetabulum. Iliac oblique view looks like a very simple fracture pattern, almost horizontal in nature, which is exactly what we're seeing here uh, on the dry, dry bone that we've uh, drawn out, uh, and a major displacement occurring only here, very high on the anterior rim.
So I'm comfortable now that the data from the CT scan hasn't uh, changed um, my drawing and that I uh, have hopefully an accurate representation of the fracture pattern drawn on the articular surface. And we know obviously now from looking at this that this represents a complex transverse plus posterior wall fracture with a multifragmentary posterior wall and articular impaction of the roof of the acetabulum occurring at the transverse and that the level of the transverse fracture goes through the roof and therefore is termed a transtectal fracture, right? So transtectal transverse with multifragmentary posterior wall.